to the extent that we live our lives in a manner that is consistent with the truth in our heart, we thrive. Welcome to the Meyer Clinics podcast, and you just heard a quote from one of your hosts, Dr. Lisa Day. Join our licensed clinical professionals from various backgrounds as they discuss fascinating mental health topics with a wide range of guests. Meyer Clinics is a Christian counseling organization with multiple clinics nationwide dedicated to treating the whole person emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Welcome to our listening family. We thank you for joining us. Are you guys hearing a funny, like, clicking noise on your end? No. Okay. Yeah, I don't hear How long have you either. been hearing these noises? Do <laughs> 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 you, uh, <laughs> you have a fear of going crazy? <laughs> Could be. Could be. It's my headset. So no, a lot of people do when they have panic attacks. They hear things? I'm going to list that fear. Yeah. No, the uh, fear of going crazy. Oh, well, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that. Normal too. people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. This is Kristen Sinanta Walker, host of Mental Health News Radio, and I am here with the wonderful Dr. Paul Meyer. Hi, Paul. Hi. How are you doing, Kristen? Good. I'm excited about our topic today. That, again, we came up with, well, you came up with this one two minutes or one minute before we started recording. So we just wing it, folks. And hey, Melanie Van is with us, too. Hey, Mel. Hey, guys. How are you? <laughs> so, Paul, why don't you introduce the topic tonight because you did it so well uh, that we were both we were both convinced yes we need to talk about that well two minutes before the program came on I couldn't think of a topic that I was real interested in and and I was afraid that I couldn't think of a topic so <laughs> I thought oh fear <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> right and we and just, fear is something yeah we just did a show on fear last <laughs> time but this is a little this is taking it to a different place this one's so. a little bit different yeah 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 we did one on anxiety and, and, and the difference between anxiety and fear and things like that. But we're going to talk more about today about personal fears that we've all faced. You know, we have thousands of people that listen to this program, that download this program every week. And when you have fears of different things, most people think, oh, I'm the only one that has that. And, you know, we want to share even some of our own fears or common fears that we run into um, to let, to let you know that the, the things that you fear, you know, all humans fear, um, yeah. or, or a lot of humans fear, like the fear of rejection, the fear of uh, failure. One thing that I thought of is that nine out of 10 things that we fear never come true. So mm -hmm. a lot of us catastrophize and we assume, you know, that things are going to really go bad. And so we have a lot of unnecessary fear. Nine out of thing, 10 things that we fear don't come true. And the ones that do, we grow from. Right. And so... It's, it's almost a good thing that some of the things we fear do come true. A fear of uh, going crazy. I see a lot of people with, uh, that are real normal people, but they're going through um, either stress or, or they may be going through a, a very nice life that, where they don't have a lot of stress, but they got sexually or physically abused in childhood and they have unconscious buried things from that. And so little things like seeing a TV show that has somebody that's abused or things like that, that they may all of a sudden have a panic attack where their heart beats fast and they feel like, you know, they're choking and they're trembling and things like that. And in their mind, they don't know what it came from, but, you know, as a psychiatrist or therapist, we can trace it back and, and realize it's a fear from their childhood, but they have part of um, a, a common symptom people have when they're having a panic attack is the fear of going crazy. Mm. They're not going to go crazy. But they have a fear of, of going crazy and losing control. So there's just, you know, all kinds of fears. You know, we just witnessed recently the school shooting. Right. And uh, and so, you know, we have a, I don't have a lot of fear of that because it's so, it's still statistically improbable. But, you know, I think we all have a little bit of fear that some crazy person or terrorist or somebody, you know, might shoot us or something or hurt us. You know, I thought about. You know, if we, uh, my wife and I would like to go to Israel sometimes, but 
that can be a dangerous place. You know, I've thought about going on a cruise someday, but that can be a dangerous place. You know, and uh, I'm not going to get so fearful that I'm going to just stay locked up in my house because you're probably just as likely to get hurt in your house as you are anywhere else. Right. I know a man that was, you know, he was a higher up in the police force and his son became a policeman because he followed his dad's example. His son, his son served as a cop for maybe 15 years working in, you know, doing a beat in dangerous areas and things like that. And the, fi- the father finally persuaded the son to get out of the police force and the father helped the son get started with a, a little store. And the first week running the store, somebody came in and robbed the store and killed him. So you just, you know, you just never know. You know, I like this thing that happened in Florida. You know, that's pretty scary when somebody comes into school and, and shoots a lot of people. And they and when you witness something like that, you have post-traumatic syndrome and, and you have panic attacks and nightmares and you jump if somebody makes a noise behind you. You can have a lot of fear. For years, I've, I've got a good buddy that, that I like to play cards with. And and he was in the Vietnam War. I mean, he's, you know, my age, you know, so he was in the Vietnam War and he saw his buddies get their heads shot off and things like that. And he's a real calm, you know, fun guy that jokes around and all that. But we went to the kitchen to get a snack in between card games. And uh, I accidentally dropped a pan behind him and he hit the floor. He jumped down and he was on his hands and uh, on his hands and feet mm-hmm. on the floor, you know, looking around for a soldier, you know, for an enemy soldier. And then he realized what he had done and he got back up and said, that's, I still do that once in a while. Mm-hmm. So there's all kinds of fears. What are some things that you guys have experienced fear in? Like, I, I'll tell you just one more thing, then I'll shut up. <laughs> I have a fear that I'm going to talk too much. <laughs> that one often comes, and that's because that, that often comes true. And that never happens on the show. It does does not. It's equal. We've we've checked it just because just I have that same fear, Paul, that I am the host, and yet I take over. The, and I did have one person, uh, one not, not nice person that wrote the nastiest email about how I need to just shut up and this, that, and the other. And so, you I don't know. ever feel like you have <laughs> the uh i can if, if somebody knocked on my front door right now and said you know we're from um, cbs or whatever tv channel there was just a crisis an hour ago and we want you to talk to and we've got eight million viewers and we want to do a live interview right now with you on that topic i wouldn't have any fear of doing that right but then if i had to sit down with the i mean i i, I love doing stuff like that. i did live radio to two million people a day for 20 years but if I had to sit down with the cameraman afterwards and have a chat with him, I'd have a fear that he might not like me or something. Oh, you know, interesting. So one-on-one, one-on-one meeting new people, I get, I get afraid. Hmm, Even though I'm a psychiatrist and I meet new people all the time. When I'm meeting a client, I don't have much fear, just maybe a little bit, but not much. I, I love doing it. But if I'm meeting a stranger, hmm. I don't like to go to parties where I don't know the people that are going to be there. Because I don't like meeting a lot of new people. So I've got a little bit of social fear. Yeah, social okay. anxiety. That's enough. I'll shut up. <laughs> How about you, Melanie? What are some of the things? I know for Melanie. some of the things that you guys fear? Yeah, Melanie, I know for you, you have talked about, you know, you have a son who's a teenager and you have a younger son that's in very, you know, or kindergarten, I guess, is what he's in. So you have the very real fear of sending your children to school every single day because of what's I, going on. I do. I do. Um, I was really affected. I wasn't as affected by Columbine because I just, I'm not even so sure that my oldest son was born yet. I don't remember exactly when that happened, but the shooting in Connecticut deeply affected me and really just, it. I think it sends terror through every parent's veins. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've had three or four warnings come to us in emails from the schools. There was a uh, two temporary lockdowns There's my 17 year old has shown me images on social media of people at his school posting threatening messages, pictures of themselves with guns. And he was afraid. He was afraid. He literally did not know whether he should go to school in the morning. Luckily, at about 6 a.m. that morning, we got a message from the school and from the local police department that the situation had been handled and that the young man that had made the threat would not be going to school that day. So these are real life things that are occurring in so many schools are having these types of threats. I literally just have to put both my children in the hands of God every morning when I drop them off because it, it really can just be a terrifying world 
to send your kids into. I mean, Kristen, you and I were at a movie with my 17 year old and his girlfriend over the weekend, and Mm -hmm. it was a very popular movie. And I tell you, they searched our purses Mm -hmm. before we went in. I've never had that happen at a movie theater. And there was, you know, just what, maybe every 20, 30 minutes, Kristen, someone was in there walking up and down Mm -hmm. the up and down the aisle checking and making sure that everything was okay. So, I mean, that in and of itself is kind of scary that you can't go in the movie theater and not have your purse checked. So those types of things scare me all the time. I mean, I I have a little bit of a different situation where I have a special needs son that can't speak for himself. If he were ever to get lost, he wouldn't be able to tell anyone who he is. I fear that you know, he'll be taken or he'll leave the house because he does elope sometimes. But luckily we have this service dog now that can help us with that. And, and then my 17 year old, you get into, well, they're starting to drive. And those are fears that every parent has, or, you know, I feel like it was kind of a lot safer to experiment with drugs and alcohol when, when I was growing up than it is now, because, You know, you hear about kids experimenting and the first time they, you know, take a take a drag off someone's weed, they're ODing on fentanyl. So it's just there's just scary. It's 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 just a scary place. It makes me so sad for my for my children that they don't have a safe environment to grow up in. And I see this daily, the effect that anxiety and instability has on young people. This is the post 9-11 culture. They don't have the stability that we had, this immediate social media type thing where you immediately hear about how horrible things are. Yeah, it's it's just, it's a different, there's a lot of praying going on in this house. That's all I got to (laughs) say. Every night, every night. What about you, Kristen? Well, I, um, I wasn't afraid. Uh, I was certainly afraid when my son was in the Marines because he joined during, yeah. you know, wartime. So um, I was very afraid of that and something happening to him. Um, and I was afraid at his school. It was a pretty harsh school. But I grew up one of the you mean schools. Bullies? No, no. I mean, it was like harsh in what way? It was like a hardcore, like in a not in a very bad neighborhood school. A lot of gang type stuff. That was one of the high schools that he went to. So, but I went to a high school like that. I mean, one of my friends was stabbed at the school, and um, just all kinds of stuff like that happened. So, and I just was for I had this very sheltered life in a way. from that kind of stuff. And then I had this very non-sheltered life experience, um, just running in tandem next to each other all the time. So I've had guns in my face at a young age and with somebody like your friend, Paul, that had a, a moment, it was with a Vietnam vet and he thought I was an intruder and I was just going to the bathroom in his house. It was a friend of mine's stepfather. And I had to talk him off a ledge and I was like 14, I think when that happened. So I've had a lot of that kind of stuff happen. And I think that's why I was okay to like go work, you know, in a lockdown facility with the therapy dog. Um, and nothing, nothing shook me to my core, made me afraid for my person. Uh, my fears have been more around not understanding uh, people that are psychologically trying to screw with my mind that are emotionally trying to mess with me. That's been my big fear, like not understanding why someone is playing mental games with me and what's the, and that's a good fear. Yeah. That's a good fear. That's a good fear. Yeah. A fear of manipulators. A fear of manipulators. Yeah. Is a a good fear. Uh, There was a study done in, in a shopping center where they were in a group of shopping centers. And I remember they interviewed something like a hundred thousand people and they asked them some questions and paid them, you know, $5 or something like that to answer them. And and they answered them anonymously. And one of the questions was, would you steal from your neighbor if you wouldn't get caught? This is the United States. And three out of four said they would. Yeah. That that's crazy. You know, that, that's just, uh, that's our culture today. When I, when I grew up, we didn't even lock our doors at night and some farmers would, uh, go out with a card table in the morning up by their, on the street, you know, in front of their house and put a bushel of apples on there and another little empty basket saying, 
you know, 50 cents per apple. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, they'd go pick up their money <laughs> and whatever yeah, apples right. were left. <laughs> now, if you did that, the table, the apples and the money would all be gone, you know, within about <laughs> half an hour. Yeah, not everywhere. Things are different now. Yeah, it's funny how it's where I live in North Carolina, that doesn't happen. But I mean, I did steal. I went through a stealing phase as a kid. I just wasn't, I did not have a lot of, uh, no one was really watching what the heck I was doing. I was alone a lot. And so I would do, I, I did, I did steal. It, it didn't last very long, but I had horrendous guilt and shame about it. And then I decided I don't want to you know, be that kind of a person. And I, you know, didn't do it anymore. But that was definitely a phase I went through. You know, I don't know why. It's not like I watched somebody doing that. Um, now I can see that that same like guilt and shame will come up where I feel like I have imposter syndrome. So as an example, I get asked now if I was just if it was just my podcast, Mental Health News Radio, I wouldn't be asked to do some of the things that I do. But the fact that I created this network, all of a sudden that's made me like look like I'm this expert, right? And I'm not saying I haven't had, you know, years of experience in the mental health field and all that, but I don't have a degree in counseling or anything. And I'm very open about that. I don't think I know more than counselors and I don't try to counsel people, especially with this show. Um, so, I mean, I have counsel. You have a lot more horse sense. You have a lot more horse sense, Kristen, than, <laughs> than uh, most of the counselors that I've met in my life. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I hear a lot, but it's still, I get asked to be on a news show to talk about something like, you know, what do I think of the Me Too movement? Or what do I think about, uh, you know, how do you tell if you, you, what are some red flags going on a first date, if you think someone might be severely codependent or a narcissist, and I and they know that I'm not a counselor. And the only reason they're really having me on is because I'm the CEO of this network of podcasts about mental health. So that I guess lends me some bigger credibility. But when I'm sitting there, I don't, those don't scare me either. Like you said, Paul, I kind of get a little bit of a zappity doo dah of adrenaline doing that. Ah, get on right now and be on this, you know, nationally syndicated television program for eight minutes talking about whatever. But I do sit there like, oh my God, I feel kind of like I'm a fraud. <laughs> and like, what if somebody point blank asked, do you even have a degree in counseling? And there's 3 million people listening. And I'm like, well, no. Yeah. <laughs> I am a patient. Yeah, when, I first did, when I first started doing uh, live radio, I'd, I had a real fear of not knowing the answer. I'd get almost panicky. Somebody would ask me a question. Yeah. And I, I remember on the on the first show, somebody asked me a question, and I, and I, jo I jotted down real quick just uh, some notes I could hardly read, you know. And I said, "Well, here's three things you three things you can do." And I listed one, and then I forgot what the whole question was. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, fortunately, I was doing it with Dr. Minerth, and I said, uh, "Well, Dr. Minerth, what?" What are two more that you can think of? You know? Stay fast on your feet. <laughs> well, I was scared to death. Good quality. But after, yeah, after doing it enough, though, it was like talking to my sister, you know, on the on the phone. Right. And, you know, somebody asked me something I didn't know. I just say, I don't know. What What do you guys think? You know. Yeah, that's how but, I am now too. I just say I don't know, and I've never said I'm a counselor. I just, I guess, from some of the people that I've ticked off that you know, demanded, they're probably serious narcissists um, and demanded that I have them on my show. And no, I can tell you this, not as much, but yeah, people with a personality disorder, a narcissistic personality disorder, they can definitely really rattle me in terms of when I know that they want my, they want something from me and I am not going to give it to them. There's a definite panic around how am I going to artfully get out of this in order to get me off of their radar, that can yeah. rattle me. It, I used to jump right into it with them. And then, boy, I was in deep doo-doo yeah. for a long time about it. Now I just smell it and go, how's this going to happen? And then it goes away of a nice, peaceful yeah. thing. But I don't like those. Those definitely scare yeah. me a little bit still. They get angry. They oh. get angry. You know, and, yeah. you know when, when if I go to a a book signing or go speak somewhere. It seems like always uh, there'll be a couple of people that'll hand me a copy of the book they just wrote and say, you know, will you read this and write me back and let me know what you think of it and uh, think about writing an introduction to it and stuff like that, you know. Right. Um, and I just have to tell them, you know what, I've got so much to do. I just don't have time. That. But I have a fear of their, the anger of narcissists. I don't yes. know why. I do too. Why I do. Melanie, you can, you know, you do too, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, um, it's it's like this double edged sword you get when you're an empath, right? Because you can sense uh, darkness and you can sense, you know, what I'll just call evil. And sometimes when you know you're in the presence of that, it can be very threatening. It's really yeah. can be a mind game. It really can be a really tough mind game that you play with yourself and others. And I certainly have been around narcissistic rage and it is scary. I remember telling someone this in the counseling office, you know, that you should be scared of that rage. Like if you, if you're not afraid of, of that type of rage, then Boy, I don't know where you came from. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. think anyone should be really afraid of that type of rage. And then also, being that we're on the topic of narcissists, we've gotten this little tangent here. The ease in which they lie. Yeah. Because when someone creates a false reality, then what do you really have to stand on? If someone is gaslighting you continuously and doing things and then turning right around and say, well, that's not what I intended or I didn't do that or this is why I did that and it's just condescending and all those types of things, then where is your grounding? Where's your footing? And so those types of situations are extremely kind of just fear inducing because when trust is gone, what do you really have? Those to me are extremely dangerous situations that would incite fear in anyone. I'll talk about a fear I have, and this is just to get off the narcissistic tangent. <laughs> Chris and you and I have been talking about this. I am petrified of snakes. <laughs> I am petrified of snakes. Kristen, you are petrified of spiders. I kill <laughs> spiders. You, you tell me that you would kill a snake. I have killed a snake before. Well, I wouldn't but it necessarily been kill it. I'll right. go pick it up and I'll take it somewhere. <laughs> well, these I've are killed, poisonous I've, snakes. I've killed poisonous snakes. I've yes, killed I've killed poisonous. Snakes. I've never One killed a black kitchen. snake. Oh, geez, yeah. in oh your my kitchen. gosh, Good in Lord. your kitchen? What kind of snake yeah. was it, Paul? A uh, coral. Ooh. Oh, my. I live that in is Texas. scary. You know, we... We That's had a rattlesnake nasty. fall off the roof one time. Oh, yeah. Oh, my Lord. Or dropped down uh, from the roof one time. I've stepped on a rattlesnake. Not fun, but they don't, snakes don't scare me. Bugs, roaches, spiders. Oh, and I, I just. Because oh. they symbolize something. They symbolize something. And that's, and what we're really afraid of isn't the, the snake necessarily. I mean, although we ought to have a, a little bit of fear of, you know, getting bit by. Yeah snakes or spiders but uh, i think they symbolize something when you're when you have a specific um a specific phobia for uh, like uh, germs or um, mm -hmm. a snake or whatever you know then there's usually a symbolic reason. mice yeah a friend of mine is so scared of mice and these mice this family i mean i'm such an animal freak lover she's like oh kill them all and it's this mommy mouse with like eight little babies trying to drink from mommy's teats and I lifted over the basket very carefully because it was in her outside shed and she was screaming and she was coming after them with a broom and I I mean I swear it was like I suddenly became you know this person with religious force I pointed at her and said stop you will not harm these mice <laughs> and I let them go and I was like ushering the babies to the mother in the weeds and I felt and this is I was like 36 when this happened so I did but if there's a roach I and they can't you know they don't bite you they're just oh. yeah I I just I have a very irrational fear of um of them probably because my dad had them in his apartment all the time and uh I just and I didn't feel safe there um ever because he was a, he also enjoyed just completely terrorizing me so there's something to do with that with the roaches he would throw them at me and whatever so I'm sure that's what it is I probably need to go to something where I stick my hand in a thing and have them crawl all over me and finally get over it but uh I'm not quite ready to do that yet you know <laughs> You know, you mentioned narcissism. Uh, I'm afraid of my own. And uh, mm. I mean, I, and, and you know me pretty well. I, you know, I think yeah. I'm a pretty nice guy. And I, yes, you are um, very. If I have temptations uh, just like everybody else, you know. And uh, if I find myself uh, thinking uh, sinful thoughts, um, or uh, one benefit of being married is um, when I am, uh, sometimes I'm narcissistic without knowing that I am. And if you have a good Irish wife, you know, then she points it out. <laughs> and when I think about it, when I think about it, you know, I think, you know what I was, I was being narcissistic, you know, I was setting the temperature where I wanted it without even asking her and, and regardless mm. of what she wanted and do different things. 
And when I sin, there's nothing that depresses me more than when I do commit a sin because it, uh, it just, you know, I just feel so guilty. And so I feel so mm -hmm. bad about it. So I have a fear of my own narcissistic tendencies, even though I don't think that they're real high, but no, they're but not. They're, it. That's probably what keeps them healthy for you, Paul. I mean, I understand that. I have a fear of um, my codependency and my tendency to swing from a pendulum of codependency to narcissism and a fear of when I look back at times where I've been caught up with very narcissistic people, some that I've alluded to on my show, and I look back at how, where I was, that I was, that I allowed that relationship um, to, you know, because I wasn't healthy myself, clearly, so it wasn't all their fault. And I think, oh, I have a fear of that coming back, I guess, that Kristen that was so delusional herself. I definitely have fears around that, which Melanie, you've heard plenty of, and you're like, just enough already. <laughs> I do too. I have a fear of codependency, and I think I'm a lot more careful now than I'm, you know, 72 years old. But when I was uh, in my 30s and 40s, I trusted people I never should have trusted. And oh, yeah. I had uh, I had my life savings stolen uh, when I was probably in my early forties and, um, yeah. and from book worldies and all that, you know, but, and the guy just, uh, um, took off and had legal protection. And you know, I think he filed bankruptcy to protect himself. But, you know, I, I've been attracted before to people who would rip me off yeah, me and, too. Uh, take advantage of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure why, cause my parents are both really nice people. Usually if you grew up with a parent that was that way, you're more, attracted to people like that but I, hmm. I still don't know really know why it's interesting yeah let's ex yeah let's ex <laughs> melanie do you have that fear too i know you you look at things that sometimes we're the same on some on some things but i don't know that you really <laughs> fear your narcissism i don't feel like you really do i mean i barely even know I that any of it's even there <laughs> I, well but but i think i think sometimes i do things that um just set me apart from others that maybe don't feel so good sometimes. <laughs> sometimes people don't want to stand in the places that I feel like sometimes God calls me to stand in and that can feel really lonely. And I think that's one of my biggest fears is that I'm, What's I'm an constantly, example? What's um, an example? Oh yeah. There's a really uh, good one. <laughs> yeah. Could I name a few? No, I, I guess just doing things that most people don't want to do. Like I'm in this legal case with my son's school right now and it's gone to a federal level. And I think a lot of parents wouldn't have done it. And now I'm doing it. And every day I go to school, I have a pit in my stomach, but it's just something that I yeah. feel called to do. You know, when I was 17, I took an uncle to court that was sexually abused me for years and lost an entire family because of it, but it's what I felt called to do at the time. So, and yeah. when things happen like that, oftentimes, you know, truth tellers, oh. you do end up yeah. not being around people that might would otherwise have been supportive. So I think that's what I fall back to as a fear of, um, I think I'm just, I, I have a fear of the own walls that I build around my own heart. I think that's my biggest fear because I tell you, I'll build some in about 30 seconds. I'll build about, you know, half the size of Chicago I'll build up <laughs> when, when I don't feel safe. And so it's this constant, you know, kind of communication I have with God about, you know, how do I stay vulnerable? Because I know from experience that when you wall yourself in, you wall others out and then no one receives anything and you just completely cut off, you know, any type of love or or vulnerability or feeling with anyone. So that's something that I constantly struggle with and it does lead to loneliness sometimes. So I think that's been one of my biggest fears is the fear of just feeling alone. Um, you know, Paul yeah. Simon, remember Simon and Garfunkel? No, oh, yeah. Yep. Paul Simon wrote a beautiful psychological song one time where in the song he's he suffered, a, a, he doesn't come out and spell it all out, you know, but he suffered abuse in childhood. And so he, he had a fear of people looking inside of him and, and if they saw what was inside, they'd reject him. And so he built up a wall around his soul. And then he met a gal that really loved him the way he is. And the words of the song are, or, you know, some of the words in the song are, there's a wall in China, a thousand miles long to keep the foreigners out. They built it strong, but there's a wall inside me that no one can see. And it takes a long time to get next to me. 
Mm. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, that, that is, is a really that's good. A, that's a good one for you, Mel. Yeah, that's I need to I need to pull that one up when we get off tonight, right? <laughs> yeah. And take a take a listen. But you know, everyone something has so right. It's called, I can't yeah. get used to something, something so right as somebody loving me. Okay. I wonder if that's that was about Carrie something Fisher so right. since he married huh. her. You know, I wonder if that was about her. Um mm. But I, I, mean, I didn't say that, Melanie, like, oh, yes, you need to watch out for that as if I know something. I mean, I think you're the most oh, loving, no. open, but we have a relationship where we can sit down and cry and do all that with each other. And um, so I don't see that yeah. wall as much as as you feel it, I think, because yeah. we don't have that. What about people that live in the inner city? 10 yeah. percent, people that grow up in the inner city, 10 percent of the males will die of murder 10%. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Mm. And just think uh, living in that environment that, that people have to grow up in, I feel so much empathy for them, you know, and, and, and then they, they feel locked into, uh, they've seen so much failure because they haven't had opportunities to succeed and, and or encouragement to succeed. And, yeah. and a lot of them grow up without dads, you know, 70% of the babies born are, or without a dad and uh, it's just a you know I really feel I'm really proud of the people that grew up in environments like that that really made something out of themselves and try to go back and help other people right you know some pro athletes you know I've known a lot of pro athletes in my life I've done some of the Bible studies for the Cowboys and the Rangers and some of the pro athletes in Dallas and seen some really good guys that have gone back to help out people that grew up the way they did Hi, this is Dr. Paul Meyer of the Meyer Clinics. Our Christian counselors across the country have a goal of helping all those who come to us to become what God has called them to be. If you're in a situation where you're not at peace within yourself or you just feel like there's joy that's missing in your life, we can come alongside to help you obtain peace and joy. This message is sponsored by the Meyer Clinic Foundation, a nonprofit Christian counseling ministry. The number is 1-888-7-CLINIC, 1-888-7-CLINIC. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not trying to say I understand it because I was only there every other weekend, but my dad lived in the worst, worst of the worst neighborhood ever, that kind of a neighborhood. And so I was there every other weekend and I definitely saw a lot of things that um, scared me for sure and were not safe in any way, shape or form. But that being there every other weekend is very, very different than that's the only place you see that's your only experience is that life for you know until you are older and hopefully can find a way out of it so i wouldn't even begin to try to say i can relate you know i just saw as an observer yeah i just thought about something and chris and i think you and i again have talked about this but you know there was um a, a time when I was first getting separated from my ex-husband, that finances were a real issue. And, and I did not grow up rich by any means, but I was always very comfortable. And my parents always had good jobs and we lived in a nice home. But there were, were times and there was a long, a, a, quite a few years of my life where finances were an issue. And I became very, and I'm not really in that place anymore. I'd like to be a little bit more comfortable, but I'm not in that place anymore. But it's still very difficult for me to live like, I don't know how I'm going to eat tomorrow because it was such a fear. I didn't know how I was going to buy diapers. I didn't know, you know, how I was going to pay a light bill. I had my church pay my light bill several times. Thank God for people being generous. But I still have this fear of always worrying about, well, when I go through the checkout line, my card is going to be declined or I'm going to go to the bank and it's, I'm not going to be able to draw out money. I still have that fear. I haven't gotten over it yet. So yeah, I think a lot of people have that same Absolutely. Kind of fear, even when they get, when they're not in that situation anymore, I still kind of live like that. I'm real hesitant to spend large amount of money on things that I probably really should get. And then I don't. What about you two? I have a fear of financial ruin. And, and that surprises yeah. people because <laughs> I've earned, you know, I've sold 8 million books, you know, and all that sort of thing. But, um, yeah. but that one guy I trusted, uh, you know, lost uh, millions of dollars uh, oh that I had saved up. Mm -hmm. And then, I, and I, so I had a few left, but then we made our, our clinics nonprofit where we do 2 million a year of charitable care and things like that. And, and there were times that we faced, you know, financial ruin as 
clinics, you know, because we, you know, we tend to be too nice. And, and it was, so I gave up the rest of my money. So right now, even though I'm 72 and I've earned a lot of money over the years, you know, my wife and I live in a 2,300 square foot, you know, garden home and, and uh, you know, it's, it's an okay neighborhood, but, you know, not, not, not great. And, and I, don't, I really don't have any savings of any significance at all. And if I got disabled and the clinics went under, um, I'd basically have to live on social security, you know, right. at age 72. And so I'm, I'm trying, I mean, I'm still working and making decent money as a doctor. And so I'm finally at 72, I'm starting to save up some money for retirement. <laughs> and I hope by the time I'm 92, I'll, I'll be able to afford to retire. But, but I have, so I, a lot of nights I lay in bed and, and have a fear of, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I developed uh, cancer last, uh, just last year. And, um, it had fortunately I had good insurance and but I got radiation treatment and the doctors think it's all gone I, you know I hope they're right and yep but the fear I mean what if I was disabled and it's just uh, it's I have that I have a financial fear yeah I definitely have that too I will say this though definitely have that but I have been able to create and I'm not saying I'm special because obviously all of us do this but I can create a financial thing to happen out of seemingly thin air and I've done that enough times that I don't really worry that I'm not going to get out of whatever's going on because I'll just go I'll just go okay well I'm going to do this now and I'll create a company and that company is totally different from what like going from you know having this EHR consulting firm and now we're doing this podcast network and I was like how am I going to make this work I don't know how to make this profitable how can I keep paying people how can I and we're we're doing it it's happening it's you know it is happening but there's definitely moments where I'm like am I crazy was I stupid to do this and get very fearful of what I chose to spend my money on and was that a stupid thing to do and very afraid of the choices I made in order to do this thing that is actually working out very well. So it helps be creative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I but I and have and have enough confidence in yourself to do it that, anyway. <laughs> that, that, you, that you can. Yeah. And yeah. If you try to if you set up five businesses and two of them went broke, it wouldn't be that big a deal. You'd learn from those. Yep. And three of them, what you'd probably succeed in. Yeah, like right now, I'm diversifying. I'm going to start another company. My consulting firm's still going to do what it does, not for much longer, maybe, um, only for big, big, big projects, because I really want to do this. And then I'm setting up a whole other company, too, because I like having multiple income streams. But um, but yeah, you know, that fear of I got to make payroll. That's like my biggest thing is afraid of I have to make payroll. I you know, these people are counting on me to do this. I cannot disappoint them. I am a failure if I do. I, I'll do that to myself um, when I'm feeling really pressed. And then I get through it and I'm like, what were you worried about? It's always okay. <laughs> so. Yeah. Even if failure is good for you. Yeah. So even if you failed, you'd learn from it and, and uh, move on. Abraham Lincoln was one of the greatest presidents we ever had and he went through bankruptcy twice and other he had other significant losses in his life and they prepared him to be president i got a question for you gals sure the teen the teen suicide rate right now is 300 percent higher than it was 50 years ago hmm. and what do you think i know they have a fear of being bullied you know and the, and i know part of it might be because they look at everybody else li else's life on facebook and you know, where people put their best things down there and they think that their life is so inferior to everybody else's. But what, what do you think teenagers fear so much that one out of, um, I saw a study of 90,000 teenagers in, the, um, in a big psychiatric journal that, that showed that I think it's one out of every 23 or it's not very many, one out of 23, less than 30 female teenagers in the United States will attempt suicide sometimes sometime in the next 12 months. Yeah. Wow. So why? You know what are what are teenagers afraid of these days that makes them want to, you know, die? Melanie, you can start on that one. <laughs> I think so much of it is um is pressure 
there's so much pressure on young kids these days. I think I've said this before on a show. My son's ninth grade field trip was to college campuses. I mean, I don't remember my field trip, but I, I know it wasn't to college campuses. <laughs> um, and, Mine and was so to a I pickle think, factory. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I don't remember. But it's, yeah, it certainly was not to visit colleges and have to decide what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I do. I think I think social media has a part to do with it. I think we they don't feel as connected as they used to. Um, That's a big one. That's a big one. Yes. Yeah, I, and, their, and, their relationship is with their phone. Yeah, you know, exactly. Um, instead of with people. Yes. And I think that that's a piece of it. I think it's just a multitude of things. I think there are so many, the availability of drugs and this, that, and the other are, are so easy to get your hands on. And then it's easy to get involved in those things. Um, Virtual faith was a big one on that. I just remembered uh, yeah. all of the 90,000 teenagers teenagers that had a relationship with God and uh, attended some church youth group with yeah. a fellowship with other people had a much lower suicide rate and a lot higher happiness rate. Yeah. And yeah, there's a lot the of connection. teenagers today that don't have that religious faith yes. or connection. Yeah. I think connection is a big piece of it. And then just, again, it's just this anxiety and depression. And I think... I think their needs just can't be met. I think adults, I think things have changed so fast in the lives of teenagers that are, of people that are teenagers right now. I think things have changed so fast that adults literally have a really hard time relating to yeah. kids now because it's just such a different world. It is such a different world. And I think it makes them feel like, outsiders or no one can understand them, et cetera. I mean, we've talked about this, Kristen, one in five, one in five teens has a diagnosable mental illness. And what yep. is it like 70, 70% of them are not treated. Yes. And we one all out know. Of five that, have a genetic, one exactly. out of five people have a genetic uh, mental, mental illness, including exactly. me with my, AD, with my ADHD. You know? Right. Yes. Yes. I mean, I, and another, I had a patient. I had a patient just about two weeks ago, uh, Melanie and Kristen, who was probably, uh, she was a college girl and, and she had extreme anxiety. And I said, what is it that you're afraid of? I'm afraid that I won't be more successful than my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, isn't yeah. that something to be afraid that you won't be more successful than your friends? There's such well, it's a... so hard. It's so hard to get in college these days. It's just, it's, again, it's that. It's that pressure. And then the other piece too is, and I saw this when I was counseling teenagers, which I haven't, you know, I haven't practiced probably six or seven years now in a counseling office. But I remember sitting in my office thinking, when did it become uncool to care? Right. Like that's really what I felt like is that it just wasn't cool anymore to care. The cool thing was just not to care about anything, not to care about your body, not to care about having sex, not to care about drinking, not to care about this. I mean, just not to care about pets, nothing. I mean, it was like, wow, when when did it become so uncool to be a human being? I mean, and I remember thinking that. And so I don't know how that got in the mixture of what teens are, are dealing with these days. But and I've, I've read some articles, too, about this huge difference between what the life that parents create for their children, and that would be into adolescence, and then what reality really is when you hit a teenager. And I think that's a transition that so many kids have a hard time making now because I think the life that's presented to kids is different than the life that was presented to kids 20 years ago. And then it's just this huge juxtaposition of what of what reality actually is when you get to school and how are you going to have all these things that you've been told all your life you're going to have when literally you may apply to 20 colleges and get into none. So I just think it's a, it's multifaceted. That's my, I, my I, saw, I saw another poll of people in their twenties. What, what, what generation is that? That's not millennials. Is it in their twenties? I forgot what you call it now, but, but I saw one poll of people in their twenties where they asked them, uh, they asked them, um, uh, what's your, uh, goal in life and the most common answer was to enjoy today yeah instead of Gosh. you know you know back when i was growing up people would you know or make a contribution to society you know the the goals that we had when i was growing up are a lot different than the goals that a lot of people have today 
I think um, one of the things I notice with some friends that have um, 20, you know, 18 to 24 year olds and who grew up with social media, I, I got really lucky in a way with my son because he absolutely abhors it and he doesn't care. So he will just, he has the ability to just not care about that kind of stuff. So he just won't go on it, even though that was part of his growing up too. But these people, these 18 to 25 year olds, um, they're so, they're absolutely competing with a fake life against someone else's fake life. And so they (laughs) have these jealousies and these deep wounds, um, that are hitting them at ages where developmentally and even younger than, you know, 18 developmentally, they're not ready yet to have that much stimulus and that much wounding and hurt feelings on display the way that it is. So in order to protect themselves, they have to anesthetize themselves with whatever it may be shutting down or drugs drugs or whatever uh, addictions of, yeah, a computer addiction. I mean, a, a lot of different kinds of addiction. Yeah, because you can't alcohol. You can't keep up with that world that isn't real. It isn't real, and then you're comparing your not real world with somebody else's world that also isn't real. And then people are are hurting each other, and it's too. It's like too much information. You. St- go look at other people's profiles and you see, oh, they're talking to someone else and then you get jealous. Well, it's, it's too much in a, um, a young person's experience of life that we're supposed to experience and learn and grow through over the course of many generations and learn those lessons at the appropriate intervals. And they're getting it all slammed at them between 10 and 20. And it's not supposed to be that way. And that I think is why it's so difficult for them. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. so I think, difficult. I think nearly all of us, I think nearly all of us as humans uh, on planet earth, 8 billion people on planet earth. And I'll, I'll bet 80 or 90% of the people on planet earth uh, deep down. And I know I feel this way sometimes deep down feel like a, a nobody, uh, mm. you know, like I, I think that was email me that said, or, or was it Kristen that said, you know, a fear that people will look through you and think that that you're being a phony or something. But yeah, um, uh, but we we I think deep down, um, maybe maybe all of us have a fear of being a nobody. And the natural thing to do is to go through life trying to prove that we're not a nobody, and we're tempted to do that through sex, power, and money, right? So sexual prowess and conquering, and 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 then uh, power um, would be you know uh, more and more. Uh, prestige and you know and rising in a company in a company and things like that and money you know having enough money to be richer than uh, the Joneses you know? yeah and, and actually not even so rising in a, not even now Paul re- the reality is because it just isn't real anymore that a teenager that goes to college is going to even get a job so it's not even about power rising yeah. in a company you know what the power is rising their social media profile yeah, yeah, that yeah, that makes a difference, Kristen. And it's something else that I used to hear, and I don't think it's always the case. And I'm sure if you ask teachers, they would be like, you know, they would deny it and say it's not true. But I remember my son tells me this, and I remember hearing this a lot from the teenagers that I used to counsel. They feel like people don't care. Yeah. So it's like, it's not cool to care, but I would hear, you know, young women and young men in my counseling office say, teachers don't care about us. All they care about is SATs. And I just, I used to think it was a little exaggerated and that they were just being, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or they were being teenagers. (laughs) But then when my son. Now we think it's insight. (laughs) Well, yeah, it is insight. I mean, my, you know, I had a teacher when my son was in the sixth grade she literally called him up after class and told him in the sixth grade now that she was really depending on him to do well on his SATs because she needed her class scores to be higher or something like that. And I was like, you have no business saying that to a sixth grade boy. Like it's that (laughs) it's your responsibility to teach these kids how to do well on their SATs, you know? So, I mean, I think, I think 
uh, my son definitely feels like now that teachers just don't care, that they just care about whatever it is that's going to get them to the SATs. And But I think in many ways, teachers are afraid to care um, in a lot of ways, or they feel helpless. They feel like they just turn a blind eye to bullying and, you know, don't don't do anything about these situations. And I just yeah. think it's, it, it's, it's very complicated, but I think teenagers do on a general note think that no one cares about their emotional well-being. All people care about is how well they do in life. Yeah. And, I think and, and one, and, you know, maybe one well-being. out of three people or one out of four people really does care, you know, yes. but, but uh, a, lot, a lot of people really don't care. And they're, no, they don't. You know, some of them are even, some of them are even hoping that, that he'll fail. Yeah, I mean, and I would, when I think about my high school experience, I mean, I hated high school, but I would have never said my teachers didn't care about me. I always felt very cared for. Um, And even the kids that got in trouble all the time, I just felt like the teachers did care about us and our well-being. It was not just about what grades were going to pop up and that they were going to get their state funding. I never felt like that. I mean, that, that that a fifth and sixth grader has insight into that is sad to me. Yeah, I still know, remember. I sad. still remember all my. I still remember all my elementary school teachers, and, yes. and how much they cared. You yes, know. I do too. Even if I got a new pair of shoes, they'd notice. I know. And, and I that, know you know. from being in a Montessori school, very small classroom. You know, private school, very much caring, a lot of caring, and then going to a yeah. huge public. Um, eighth grade and then a public high school and these teachers were dealing with so much stress fights knives and this is you know when I this is 1985 1983 1984 these were huge huge inner city schools and you know going from the they get their lives threatened exactly and and they I just I I remember feeling for them like my god how can they do their jobs because they're getting flack from the parents. They're getting flack from the kids. They're getting flack from administrators to do their jobs. They're not making enough money. So I can see this whole other side to it. They're just human beings and they're, and and just seeing it from that very secluded, isolated, but in a good way, private school experience where, oh my gosh, Kristen drew a petal of a flower. Let's give her an award. Yeah. Isn't she wonderful too? I missed, I remember being terrified of um, not getting my homework done in private school because every assignment that you didn't do, you, you know, you, you got a call. And the first time in public school, and mind you, I was going through all the stuff with my dad and all that stuff was going on too. So I was very, very depressed. But the first time that I missed an assignment, I was so afraid and the teacher said nothing about it. My mom never got told about it. And from that one moment on, it was like a free pass for me to not do any of my schoolwork or do as little as possible because it was like, oh, I'm not going to get caught. Well, then what do I even need to do it for? I was too depressed to even think. So yeah, it was just a different, it's such a different experience when you get into over packed inner city schools where there are just big schools with lots of kids. And these teachers are just trying to. One other up. fear that we haven't mentioned that when they've done polls on things, people fear one of the top two or three is the fear of death and dying. Mm. And oh, we, yeah. we didn't yeah. that. And I know, you know, I've had that fear before off and on, and I had a, a really bad car accident on November 15th, 1989, where head on collision, where my car actually flipped up in the air and, mm-hmm. and flipped around in the sky. And I landed on the roof and both cars were totaled, but, but I wasn't hurt, but, but I had a, you know, and I'm not going to go, we don't have time to go into the dream and all that sort of thing, but um, oh, I think you talked about what I did really on the show. Yeah. I've talked yeah. about that before, yeah. but, but the Bible says, reckon yourself dead onto Christ. And it, it, and what it really means is get out of the rat race and pretend like you died, and then every every day from that day forward is a is a gift. So I I pretend and I still remember remind that myself of that. That's why I remember the date that I pretend like on that day I died in a car wreck. So every day that I live now is a day that I can love and be loved and hopefully make a contribution in the lives of others. And and so my fear of death is a, is a lot less now. And when I when I did get cancer uh, uh, last year, 
of course I real I wasn't really excited about it, but <laughs> I thought, well, you know, I, I died in 1989 and I've lived quite a long time since then. Right. So if I die, you know, then it's not that big a deal. All of us are going to die. Everyone Jesus healed when he was on earth died of something else later, you know? <laughs> so, right. you know, if I die, I'm, I mean, I believe that, you know, I'm going to go to heaven, not because I deserve it, but because, you know, God forgave my sins. And so I, I don't think I have a whole lot of fear of death or dying now, but I used to. I don't, I don't feel like I do after my stepfather passed. I really don't feel like I am. I, I haven't been tested lately and I hope I'm not, but um, I don't, I feel like we go to such a great place sometimes that it's like, it's on my hard days. I'm like, can this be over yet? Can I just go to the great place? <laughs> because this sucks. <laughs> this sucks. But I, I do think what, like what you just said, Paul, okay, I want to do what I was called to do in, you know, this, this experience, uh, you know, this in my life. And if I, mm -hmm. if I go before I do that, there will be regret. And I don't, I really don't want that. So that's how I sort of temper that. But I do really feel like we go to such a beautiful, wonderful place that I don't have a fear of too. going there at all. I'm like, oh, thank God. Okay, I did everything I was supposed to do. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> so anyway. And if we happen to be, I, I believe it, I believe in, in heaven with all my heart, but if we happen to be wrong for some reason, we won't know anyway. <laughs> exactly. Because how do we know? <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we won't miss it, you know. <laughs> what about you, Mel? You close the show on. What do you think about about that? That is a huge oh, gosh. for people. Way to way to leave it. Way to leave <laughs> and go on how I think about death. Think of, <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> I have a fear of Kristen asking me these kinds of questions already. Past exactly. the time on the show. I have yeah. a fear of being putting put on the spot. No, I mean the only fear I have about death is is leaving my my kids, mm. um, especially my special needs little boy and, and not knowing how he, he'll be taken care of. But I just, I don't have any fear whatsoever. I mean, it's interesting to think about how it might happen, I guess. I hope it doesn't happen anytime soon, but I don't, I mean, it's just, it's just the beginning of an entire new life. So it doesn't, it doesn't scare me at all. I think there's great peace in it. And I'm just, you know, it's exciting to think about meeting Jesus. I mean, seriously, <laughs> it really is. You know, what will it be like to celebrate like Christmas? Jesus, and you know what? You know, God loves your, uh, <laughs> God loves your, God loves your special needs child a thousand times because he's God and we're just human. And I you know. love your child dearly, but God loves your special needs child a thousand times more than, than yes. you ever could. Yes. So he would take care of him one way or another. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Good point. Yeah. I don't, I don't have that. I don't have that fear. I, there was a time in my life where I did, though. I definitely was afraid of it. But I, I've had some close family members pass away. And just through that experience, I have not been afraid at, at all anymore. Yeah. I saw my grandpa and my mom and my dad. I was with my mom and my dad when they died. And they both had big smiles on their faces. And watching them die makes me almost look forward to it. Like, yeah. Man, I hope yeah, mine's like that. My, yep. my, my stepdad, boy, he just, he all of a sudden looked like a young boy. He looked like a young boy and he had a smile on his face and he just, um, yeah, it was a beautiful, it was sad. Oh God, it was sad, but it was, it was very spiritual being holding his hand, you know, while somebody passes from this earth, you know? So I, um, yeah, I used to fear about, uh, I used to have a big fear about Michael passing away before our son could emotionally handle it. And I did ask Michael once in the hospital, you can't go yet. And boy, did he want to go because he <laughs> lives in a lot of physical pain. And uh, the next morning he was a different person, but I said, you can't, Kellen cannot, he, his, he won't survive this now. And now I know that he could. And so Michael can just kick the bucket anytime. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's going to hear that. You ever hear that? Michael's listening to this, to no. this podcast right he, now. <laughs> this is his favorite of all of our shows. Is the show. So he is Michael, she's just yeah. kidding. I'm going to say nothing and let him listen to she's it. And kidding. I will get a phone call and he'll be like, thanks a lot, Chris. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> he'll just laugh. I know Michael. Yeah, he'll just laugh. He He's not going yeah. anywhere. His his family live until they're like 101 and they can have, you know, seven heart stints and Lou Gehrig's disease yeah. and all these, and they just keep on trucking. So I, he, I'm, he's probably going to outlive me. I told him you're going to be spoon feeding me in a bed. It's not going to be the other way around. <laughs> but anyway, well, I think we covered what, what would we call this? Cause we, we titled the last one fear, our personal fears. Uh, things, how about things that we all fear? Things that we all yeah. fear. Like that. Okay. Things that we all fear. Okay, that sounds good. All right. Well, thank you People both. We'll feel normal. Yes, we want that food. was the point, Paul, you brought up in the beginning. You wanted us to share some of our own fears so that because that fear of being lonely about that you're feeling that you're the only one feeling these ways. Um so if we can offer some consolation to anyone listening that you are not alone, um, we didn't even we didn't even touch the tip of the iceberg of what the three of us have fear around. We just shared what we could in an hour. So please don't feel alone and your fears are not anything to be ashamed of um, at all. That at all. We love you. And uh, we're just glad that you're part of our, as Paul says, our listening family, which I love that saying. <laughs> So thank you both. and Thank thanks. you, Krista. Yeah. And thanks to our listeners for another edition of Roundtable with Dr. Paul Meyer on Mental Health News Radio. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Tune in next time for another engaging discussion on relevant mental health topics. If you have any questions about Meyer Clinics, please visit our website at MeyerClinics.com. That's M-E-I-E-R Clinics.com or call us at 888-7-CLINIC. Don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps. And please note that we are a member of and produced by Mental Health News Radio Network, mhnrnetwork.com.